because you just added something, but I need to be safe to be captured. Because when I say, when I come together in settings like this, it's not just the talk. I'm tired of speaking. I be you ain't tired of hearing Michelle fucking talking. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> so, you know, for me, there's something. But now I'm officially recording it. Should be captured. Okay, honey? Mm -hmm. Should be captured because when they back and they then get together after this meeting, right, there is some follow-up then that they're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe, again, that's why I said I don't play tokenism. If I come out, you know what I'm saying, and we're going to be doing some stuff, I'm doing my follow-up. So, you know? I just... Full accountability. I yeah. want to say, just raise so. your hand in this room if you're a researcher. So if you look around, all of these individuals came out to hear you guys, to mm -hmm. actually come out, to engage in dialogue, and REACH is connected to clinical trials that do cure, but how many of you are basic scientists, basic researchers in this room, are working with cells and labs? All of these, so this is the time when they say, silicone isn't, you know, you can't do it now. This is the time to talk about, this is how I live, and this is how I need it to work for me, and that they can then help design a drug that works for you now, and thinking about what's coming out in the future. And I do want to get to some science questions. There was a couple of really juicy ones that came out, one about comorbidities, but I also, maybe we could talk a little bit about um, some of the sex and hormone differences and what are the potential with sex and hormones. So. Can I say something quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm proud LGBTQ transvestite. Because you see, I'm not in prison, woman clothes. But this with the silicone, especially with those immigrants that come to cross the border, they they don't have the opportunity that New York State people have, like getting hormones or breast implants, or and a lot of them have got um, silicone. I call it. I want to call it like it is illegal silicone. And sometimes doctors wanna, many years in the past, doctors wanna deal, they did not wanna deal with it. Now there are some doctors that wanna deal with it, but they've been very careful to take that out because this is dangerous to your body and you can get all the in the black and some people end up dying. So that touch, and that does not discriminate, that includes everybody. It doesn't matter you're black, white, Chinese, all colors. We'll start with Brad actually to talk about. Can you talk a little bit about the geographic diversity and how maybe you know there's clearly some we're all coming from different places and so maybe can you talk a little bit about how the geographic diversity impacts our potential for cure? Yeah. So hi everyone. I'm uh, Brad. I'm a, I'm a basic scientist, but um, learning a lot, especially working with Jessica, getting a chance to learn from from all of you. So as part of Reach, we um, work with study participants here in New York and people from Canada and also from uh, Rakai in Uganda. And we are studying the virus in these people, but we're also studying their immune responses. And so the question is, is there anything different about the immune responses between these populations of people? And I, I guess from your reaction that yes. you're predicting the answer correctly. I've um, seen some data already. Seen that. Cool. Absolutely, and and so and so we want to know. We're doing mm -hmm. we're doing basic science research mostly. Marina does some clinical trials, so she can talk from that perspective. But even at, when we're studying cells, we can start to um, be inclusive of diverse people because we see that the cells respond in, in diverse ways. So I can give you a real example of that, Rayleigh. So one of the types of immune response that we think is going to be really important for curing HIV is called uh, the, cyto the killer T cell response. Have people heard of killer T cells, cytotoxic T cells? Yeah, so, so these, are, these are like um, the foot soldiers of our immune system. They, they patrol around the body, they're looking for virus infected cells, they're looking for cancer cells, and when they see them, they, they, they kill them immediately. It's, it's exactly um, the way you would imagine it. Uh, and so getting back to the difference between the populations, we studied the killer T cells in these people from Uganda and the people from New York, and get, guess whose uh, killer T cell responses seem to be stronger? <laughs> the ones in Uganda, yeah. 
And, and so, so it's early data. I'm telling you results that we found. Adam finished running the analysis you know, last week. So early data, early data. Uh, we're gonna see if it holds up. But it was, it was different enough that it, it, it was striking to see. And so that's, that's really important for a lot of reasons, right? Because um, one, we wanna understand what is the role of these killer T cells in containing the viral reservoir. Could I ask you something Please. along that same line? And if any of you, you know, I have a lot of information, knowledge that I've read up about zombie cells. They are not dead cells and they're laying there in the body, they're really not doing anything. Yep. Mm. And I wanted to know if any of you guys, you know, have looked anything because I figure there might be some answers within the zombie cells, within those of us who, you know, I'm in my 33rd year, and yes, I got a couple comorbidities, but my organs and they are really not devastated. Mm -hmm. And when I'm saying my organs and they, because if nothing else, I'm, I'm keeping on top of my lab work. I do not just look at CD4 and viral load. I look at other, you know what I'm saying, other whole issues that's going on with me. I look at my diet, I look at, you know, so I started, you know, since I'm, again, back in active days, the person who put me onto that, he's no longer here, God rest his soul. His name is Stephen Hinden. God rest Stephen's soul, but I remember him. But these zombie cells, I, I really want to hear from the scientists because yeah. When I ask these people in MacWise, these hundred and almost fifty million dollar project that is funded by NIH, you know, they're looking at me like, Michelle, what are you talking about? Yeah. And so they got them on the, could you all tell people what yeah, that is? So yeah. I think you might be talking about like, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, these, these, yeah. these are the cells in which HIV is, is sleeping. That the good news, yeah, there you can think of them as zombies, but the, the good news is we, we can kill them. Right. <laughs> we just need those killer cells to see yeah. them. And so that okay. ties into what I was saying earlier, because we knew for, for several years that the number of these zomb zombie cells, mm -hmm. the cells that can reactivate and make HIV, the cells we want to get rid of, that those are lower in this population in Uganda. There was a study about this. And now we see that the killer cells, if we can kill them, we have this early data that suggests they're stronger. So do those two things go together? And if so, maybe we can learn something really fundamental that, hey, these killer T cells can be effective at killing these zombie cells. That's one possibility. I'm, I'm again talking basic science research, so this is all stuff coming out of the lab right now. Um, the other thing. So is it in Uganda? Yeah, so that's where they had fewer in the inner thigh, right? So, mm -hmm. so even, even lower ones in, in the women. And, Adam's going to look at those killer T cell data right now to see if they're stronger. Well, not right now. Men and women. No, right. 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 There are rare, very, very rare people who can naturally eliminate all of these infected cells, and we're learning more about, trying to learn more about how that is. But in most, the vast majority of people with HIV, this latent HIV reservoir persists for a very, very long time, basically for the lifetime of the person. And we are actually still understanding with basic science research why and how this reservoir persists. Mm -hmm. So we're still conducting a lot of research in a laboratory uh, and, but, and, and working with people living with HIV and they are graciously donating blood, they're graciously donating um, biopsy samples mm -hmm. uh, and we're trying to better understand how these, late, how these zombie cells, mm -hmm. uh, how they persist, how they, how they persist, persist. And we've learned a lot, and yeah. we've learned a lot, she even in the, the past five stuff. years, oh, we've right. learned uh, a tremendous uh, amount wow. And we're trying now to take all of that we've learned and, and move it forward into clinical trials to try to then cure HIV for, for people with an issue. But I, you know, I, Maureen is the clinical trialist in the room. Well, but, and I also see, so and Julian, Jonathan yeah. is here. And yes. Julian's had his hand up. And then but there is actually a cure trial happening here in New York. And at the end, um, Jonathan uh, Berardi is in the back is gonna help talk about that for a minute. But Julian, I see your hand. Um, since there is a killer, um, killer, killer T cell, yep. um, 
is there a way to multiply those killer T cells so that they can attack or search the body? And so that they can search the body, do the bloodstream, whatever, how the body functions, and just, you know, scientists tend to come up with other stuff where they can create certain things to multiply. So it is possible for them to multiply something to get these killer T cells to say, well, here, I'm going to attack it. Um, let me try you on, on this. Um, that's, injection that's, or medication. That's, that's, that's exactly that's right. That's exactly that's right. That's what, that's what we're... That's what we're trying to do from a number of approaches. So there's vaccines that can that can cause those killer cells to multiply. Thank you, There's vaccines and there's a. You just described. You basically described one of the strategies. Okay. Yeah. So we try to to multiply, but also improve the functioning to to make these better killer cells. Um, so we're 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 trying to improve them in, in multiple ways. So that they can eliminate those zombie cells. Mm -hmm. We I'm have QR curious. codes if you want to download and take these home right away. Out there. But, but, um, uh, but just a comment. Usually, you know, because the multi funding that goes along the way, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. um, I believe that I believe that not not um, proven, but in my own view, I believe that there is a cure out here. Um, I believe that sometimes so. the pharmaceutical company. Um, maybe has a play because we know that once there is a cure, then money will be lost. And how do they compensate for that money? But, uh, and and that, that is really bad if, if, if that's indeed the, the case. Because I've heard about even um, a stem cell, something like that, yeah. where they, the stem cell, they do, I, I don't know how stem cell go, but they implant yeah. right in yeah. the body. Exactly. Why is it not accessible? Yeah. Correctly to the max. Do you you want to speak for so it? But, but that is so so it is true. So the few so we all know that there are, or I think we all know that a few people have been cured from HIV. Right. And they have been cured it's exactly by what we're saying by receiving stem cells that are so they had but the dip, the one special situation there is that those few individuals they received this transplant because they had a very serious form of cancer. So there were people living with HIV that, that at one point in their lives, they had leukemia, for example. Mm -hmm. They were very sick, and to be treated and not die from the leukemia, they received these stem cells. The doctors that did those transplants, they were clever because they knew that there are some cells, some people, the lucky people, they have cells that are resistant to HIV. Mm -hmm. So they found donors that had the resistant cells, and then those few people with HIV, they received this transplant with cells that were resistant. So, so the virus went away because the virus could no longer live in that person's body. Okay. And how it's a very, it's a very, it's a, it's a very dangerous system because in order for you to receive these stem cells, you have to receive very strong chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So your immune system goes yeah. very, very down. But it's, it's all very important stories because we learned that it's possible to cure HIV. We just have to find ways that are safer to do so, so that we can apply to more people. Could you explain to people why this is not something that we then can say, so why medicate their favorite, or why, you know, because I truly, truly, the education that my black community still needs, I think some of the individuals who are doing some of that education, they're still not acknowledging the different impact of health literacy. You may say one thing yeah. to me, and what I hear and what I perceive is different than what it is you know you're trying to get across to me. You know, and we need to talk about these things. So we need to acknowledge these things. So, so, so I think I think the the, the message just to expand upon what Marina said is it, it's expensive, yes, but what is it? Ten percent of people who receive stem cell transplants die from the procedure. Yeah, right. I think that is ten, 10 percent die. It's not so the cost. It's, it's, it's how dangerous. Yeah. Right. Yes. Have you, you read, have your hearing? Yes. 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 Yes.
what is happening with those cells for those individuals who are now, who are now more from this cure? Yeah. In terms of what happens to the cells once so they're why, why, why is it about those cells? They get flushed out, or they get the. I mean, we all have to get skeletal, whatever. What happens to those cells when those don't necessarily even have cancer anymore, um, or are from cancer, and of course they're now they might be free of HIV or possibly cured in whatever way, and that need treatment. What then happens to those cells? So they just they just really get reversed, or they just go back even more dormant because they don't need to attack to the infection. Mm -hmm. And I think not just the stem cell, but just anybody who is controlling mm -hmm. without without therapy. What happens to those red blood cells? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and just a quick second look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Now I think that the reservoir in many different people looks very different. So in the people that receive those stem cell transplants, you go through radiation to basically eliminate your immune system for what it was previously. Right. So anything that had the virus is gonna die off because it won't proliferate. You know, HIV is so smart in that it basically picked that one cell in the body that just keeps replicating and surviving and replicating and replicating and replicating. Right. And the thing is, you know, if you get rid of the CD4 cell is one of the most important cells of the immune system, you know? It helps you make good antibody responses. It helps make good killer cells. And the problem is, is if we try and get rid of like all of those cells in someone who's living with HIV, like in the case of the bone marrow transplant where you get rid of that, you can get really, really sick, right? I think what's important about cure-related research is figuring out, you know, obviously not all of your CD4 cells are infected. There's only a small, small percentage of that. And so I think it's finding those small percentages and just having more of a targeted therapy like teaching your CD8 T cells, your killer yeah. cells, how to go after those particular mm -hmm. CD4s yes. is going to be really important. But there's there's a couple of barriers. So we talked about latency, where it becomes a zombie cell or where it becomes very quiet. In that case, CD8 T cell can't see it. It just looks like a regular, you know, old CD4 cell that doesn't, it's not infected with HIV. But HIV is also really smart in that those CD4s that it infects, they hide out in certain parts of the body that the CD8 T cells don't have access to. Yeah. So you could have really, really strong CD8 T cell responses, but there's kind of like a locked door, like it just can't really get into those mm -hmm. sites. Mm -hmm. One of those is in the lymph node, it's in the follicles, yeah. that's really important for making those antibody responses that protect you against flu and SARS-CoV-2 and everything like that. And quite rightly, you want that to be protected in someone, like in a natural setting, right? Because yeah. you want to have good antibody responses. But they also go to places like the brain Mm -hmm. And you don't really want, you know, all this inflammation in your brain because, right. you know, that can lead yeah. to a lot of, like, neurological yeah. conditions, part of the comorbidities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, you know, HIV, in addition to CD4s, not to get too complicated, but it also infects macrophages, mm -hmm. which are these tissue resonant cells that are not in the blood. They're really difficult to get rid of. But on top of that, they actually contribute a lot to inflammation. When you talk about the comorbidities like cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, you know, cancer, things like that, a lot of the underlying problem is the inflammation. And so we also think that these macrophages, when they become infected, um, they're contributing to a lot of that inflammation. And the one last thing I want to point out with the, the reservoir as well, and you know, I think, you know, obviously the pandemic that we've had over the past three, almost four years now, right? Um, has been terrible, but from a science perspective, the one thing that it's taught us is, you know, the virus has evolved. You know, we all, you know, for people that got the first shot, the second shot, you know, you got a little bit of protection, but all of a sudden they're like, oh no, there's this new strain, there's this new variant out now. Like, will this previous shot protect us from the new shot? Now they have the new Omicron variant shot that we can get, but there's no more variants. That amount of variation is like the amount of variation you have in HIV in one person. So if you think about, not just from the perspective of the vaccine, but your T cells recognizing one virus and then the virus changes and then it has to recognize the next virus and then that virus changes, you know, it's just, it's making it so difficult for your immune system, which is really good at killing off things like flu, killing off like other infections. It's just hard with HIV because it targets the, the cells that proliferate the most. It's the thing that your immune system needs the most. And on top of that, it just mutates away. It's like hitting a moving target. It's just mm -hmm. really difficult to get at that. So, you know. I, I was just going to add quickly to that that I think one of the questions that came up was 
why don't we have an HIV cure yet? And you know, Brad spoke, and Marina spoke to mm -hmm. those five people that have been cured through an intervention. There are some people that may have achieved a cure naturally, um, but it's HIV's genetic diversity. It's an incredibly diverse virus, and it makes it extremely challenging to develop a vaccine and yeah. to develop um, a cure, along with other aspects of HIV's biology that we're still learning about. Yeah. yeah. What kind of, sorry, what yeah. if they were here to develop um, um, PrEP? Yes, mm -hmm. right. The prep band. Yes, right. The prep band. Yeah. 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 When they are, I think they have the same method. Maybe, maybe not the same medication. Uh, maybe, maybe a mixture of that same medication. So, so yes, when we're when we're talking about cure, I don't. No, so I was going to ask you. I think that this is one of the things. Prep, for, uh, you know, prevention. Right. It's sort of the same. It works in all bodies yeah. and all yeah. types. And maybe you could talk a little bit about how different bodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. But I, 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 you know, for prep, um, we start now. We have a long-acting injectable prep mm -hmm. that's given every two months. I'm on it myself, um, and um, you know, then you start to blur the boundaries between what is a cure versus what's a long-acting treatment. Although Michael was commenting on that, um, yeah. uh, you know, there, there's some injectables that develop that can last as long as six months, um, and maybe we'll start getting to multiple years. Um, uh, but PrEP is medication, yeah. so this is a, it's, it's two different antiretroviral drugs that you take, it, it enters into your HIV. cells, and then it prevents the virus from, from infecting and replicating in those cells. So it's, it's actually a medication, and, and um, um, what our research collaboratory is broadly focused on is harnessing the body's own immune system in people living with HIV to try to achieve a cure. So this is when people already uh, have acquired HIV and are living with HIV. We are focused on trying then to, um, it, it's, it's uh, I, I like to say as, as an epidemiologist that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And it's, it's easier to prevent than it is, unfortunately, to cure. Um, so, so, you know, people living with HIV can take antiretroviral medications their whole life, but again, this reservoir persists for a very long time. Um, I don't, I don't know, if, uh, yeah. you know, I'm happy to. So I just, uh, so before we go on, um, so uh, Dr. Kasky has to make a so I'm going to give her maybe a minute or two to say a last word before we have to. My last, so what I'm, so just, my last word is actually to ask Michelle a question, because you said something that is still important to me. Um, because, so we are seeing a lot of cure studies being developed and being done. And all of them struggle to recruit women or transgender women yes. to, to, to recruit not men. Yeah. And, and we just yes. don't, we don't fully understand <laughs> how to, to effectively approach the community. Um, or, to, or to accommodate uh, what the different communities need. What she just said, guess what? She just opened up the door to a huge amount yes. of transgender. What I'm doing here, and guess what? I said, once you invite me at the table, trust me. There's like 20, and I'm the, and that's just a minute number. There's 20 other women whom I'm about to bring, you know what I'm saying, to talk to you. Because again, I truly believe it just came, you know, from, from you know, the conversation here. Each of us, this body anatomy, yes, we all have this one common HIV, this virus that's doing all these different things. And again, no pun intended, because I love the work that's going on with you equals you. But it cannot just be related to I'm undetectable, and you and me can have sex, and I'm not gonna transmit the virus. Guess what, life. sex ain't ruling my life. It's part of it, I love it. Mm -hmm. I just came back from be, you know, speaking at a conference about sex positivity in the HIV field. Yeah. Shit, sex is great for the immune system, but the reality <laughs> is, it's not just, you know, it's, it cannot stop that, oh, we cannot transmit the virus anymore. I want to live so I can have as much sex as I want to have. Mm -hmm. So this living, it cannot just very, a couple years ago, two or three years ago, I had these <clears throat> major blips going on with me. Because of this diabetes that I have, Michelle liked to drink her cocktails, Michelle have a sweet dude, Michelle was doing important things. And that A1C shot up to an 11. Okay, blips, blips, the viral load went over 200. And that's when I said to my doctor, you prove to me that you know what's causing this. 
because I wanted to show to him it's not a resistance to the virus, to the medications that I'm taking. Because you know, Michelle, so how many times have you mistaken your meds? Michelle, no, honey, this is one of the most adherent women taking HIV meds. So I said to him, you find out what else is going on. But I still did my little homework. Got with a gerontologist and we sat down. She said, Michelle, let me tell you about the correlation between the A1C, uncontrolled diabetes, and how it affects the viral load. Who is telling this to the black and Latino, for those of us out there who have this other, you know, issue that's going on with us, with HIV? Some of the doctors are there, oh, well, but Michelle, you know, that medication that you've been taking for all these years, you have, you have to look at how it outweighs the benefit. You are undetectable. I'm gonna die undetectable from fucking diabetes eating my kidneys out. You know what I'm saying? That's the reality. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. You know, so got that information. How are we applying it? We try to apply this ourselves. Are we getting where we are navigating our medical care for them to be able to work with us to address these things? No. Everybody's getting funded now for DEI initiatives. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. How the fuck is that trickling down to the standards of care? Yes. How is it trickling down? So these are the kind of stuff you wanted to say something. Uh, I see Michelle, great, but I then lost what I was gonna say. It's okay. I mean it'll come back, hopefully before you leave. So what what can help um, bring oh. in more yeah. You have to go to the spaces where trans women are and congregate. You have to come to the meetings because we have an inherent mistreatment and unregard for the clinical system because you had no regard for us all these years. Exactly. You wanted to use the community as test subjects and just come in and say, try this out and we're going to test, not saying you're going to test it, but just test it to see if it's going to kill us or not. We are a disposable community of people that you didn't mind throwing away. So now it's going to be hard to get us back to the table because we don't feel you are ever in our corner. Even though it's a new day and there's new technology, that old mindset is still very mm -hmm. rampant in the community. The same way Michelle goes to her doctor and says, why is it like this? And he's saying to her, well, why aren't you taking your medication? That's not what I came and asked you about. I asked you about what yep. is this? Hmm. Address the issue I'm asking you about. Don't go off on what you think it may be. Right. And that still goes on when we go to the doctor. So a lot of girls don't want to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So what they'll do is they'll go to the next girl and say, how do you feel about this? And try to pick her brain without being exact. You have to come to the spaces where black trans women go to and seek counsel and camaraderie. Because sitting, I would have never known this was going on today if I hadn't gone to the pantry and I saw the flyers and read and read about it. I had no mm -hmm. idea this was going on today. Mm -hmm. And I go to a lot of cabs that I'm on. Mm -hmm. None of them had mentioned this was going on today. Mm -hmm. You have to go to the spaces where people mm -hmm. congregate. Because you're never going to touch the community. No. Except, at we, all. And we, we have failed again and again. Yes. I just want to know about the event today myself. You just learned you sleep okay? Uh, but how's it work? You gotta be able to have a direct connect with the stakeholders. We are stakeholders. As much ghetto people would say we are, and they this and they that, guess what? We open doors. We open doors. You know what I'm saying? So again, for me. <laughs> and I want to bring, so I want to bring Michael in too, because I think that this, this idea of the mistrust that's been built up for a long time is, is real. And but what sure at least I think has the opportunity because it's still so basic to start building those relationships. So I'm very curious from both of you, actually the whole room, is like how do we build these relationships, establish that now in the basic, where where it's not in the clinical trials yet, where there's not these big phase two, phase three, where people are all of a sudden starting to really think about it, but build those relationships so we can get buy-in, input, and start a dialogue with communities and early. Not end up in a Right. We have a great drug that can't be used. Mm -hmm. I feel okay. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe Michael and we'll just yeah. Yes. So you can go ahead. No.
You see some clients, they are taking medicine. At a given moment, they give up. And they come back. I cannot take the medicine, but I'm tired. And they give up. And it affects their mental health. So this tool is very yeah. important. And we are here to see everything you need. We can help you. And so I'm going to come back to the doctor, what she said about the problem we're getting to get to the community. You know, trust is really important. And then some people, as an African immigrant or any other immigrant, they trust people from their community Amen. more someone else. Mm -hmm. For example, Stay African Services Community is a community based very well. Mm -hmm. It's a community organization. So it serves most of the time African diaspora. Mm -hmm. And some immigrants, when they come here, they have some problems like maybe <coughs> immigration status, language barrier, mm -hmm. and many stuff. And they are living with the virus mm -hmm. and they don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they come here, they need help. Mm -hmm. But I'm scared to go to the hospital because of immigration status yeah. or language barrier. Mm -hmm. So I think African Services Committee can be a bridge between you and the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you want to reach out to the African community. As I said, trust is really important for the community. Mm -hmm. So they trust more people from their community right. than the doctors. Also, Michelle talked about health literacy. Sometimes the doctor can say something, the patient can understand it in a different way. Yes. And it's a problem. Yes. And face it. So, African Services Community is here to help you to reach out the community. And see how we can work together if you want to, for the trial, or if you want to give information to the community, yeah. build trust, we are here, that's what we do. And I'm very really happy about this project. And I have just some questions. How long have you been working with this project? What are the challenges you are facing? And do you have any results? <laughs> no, and, go ahead. <laughs> and do you have hope one day you don't have all this tool? Because I think I'm happy to go. <laughs> 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 he will answer, but I, I will. We will continue this conversation. Thank you all. How long you been in, the, in this business of HIV? How long have I been doing the business of long? HIV? Since huh? 2006. Okay. Um, here with Mark, here with more peer related stuff. Probably in the last 10 years. Okay. This project specifically is it's going into it's so, a big so year three. Yeah. We're working on this. We just, just turned three. Yeah, we just, well, we just, we just started. Started. literally on uh, Monday. Two. We just started starting yeah, two. We had a meeting three. yesterday and, and the day mm -hmm. before. And so, yeah, we're, Actually, this two. is so we're, our group is funded through a five year grant from the National Institutes of Health. Nice seeing you, doctor. Hi, nice to meet you. To, to do cure research, and so many of the scientists you see here are, are also working through this program. Uh, we just we're Thank in year you, two. Doctor. We just finished year two of the program, um, and so we're funded through the flagship program through the NIH for HIV cure research, um, and they're funding ten other or nine other groups um, also doing HIV cure research. So it's it's a it's a big investment in cure science, uh, but as as. Uh, I think has, has been this word basic science has been said a lot today. The, the field is still very early, particularly in terms of clinical interventions and testing things in the clinic. We're still doing very small, what's called phase pilot. one pilot studies, phase one early clinical trials, just to assess if what we're doing is safe. And these, these, these studies take multiple years, um, and uh, it, it also can, contributes to, yeah, Michelle, thank you. Can you tell me anything about the demographics of who you have engaged so far? Mm -hmm. Because for me, again, that would be a starting point. Mm -hmm. And again, I am not here mm -hmm. to fight against mm -hmm. any of you all. Yeah. You all invited me, you know what I'm saying? I'm here about accountability and how we're gonna move yeah. forward. Yeah. So That's I'm, why I'm here. For that, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Jonathan. Um, because he Hi, actually, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan. So Jonathan is, is the coordinator that yeah. helps actually do the work on the CURE clinical trial that's mm -hmm. happening, okay. which is why I'm handing it over to Jonathan because he, I'm sure, has that data at the tip of his fingertips. Some rough paper. Okay. Hi, okay. uh, everybody. So start. Um, so yeah, I'm from Bob Cornell, and I work on Wait. one of the CURE trials, uh, and soon to be the Rockefeller study as well. Um, these are, as Adam said, very intensive studies, so it's hard for us to recruit people in the first place because it's almost like a half-time job where you have to come to the clinic multiple times, either 
twice a week every three weeks or once a week because we might be taking up the medication. That being said, we at Cornell have screened about 15 people for the study, which is about a third of the national screening. Um, over 50% are non-white. Of the four people that we've actually randomized to the study, nobody's white. So we are trying. And I think it's so important because that to me represents that there's not only diversity being represented in the study, but that there's an actual genuine curiosity and interest from all communities that we really shouldn't be ignoring. And Michelle, to your point, one of the struggles that we continue to have is identifying women. And when I say women, I mean women, all women. We don't even know. Don't act up with all the people who wrote those books and made millions of dollars. Where the people that they went and acted up for? Ask them. They, they know where the women are. But those are the relationships that <laughs> we are still looking for and that we really, I mean, desperately want to engage in because this is not something, I mean, we're all talking about the strategies and the, the approaches and the techniques. When we talk about actually enrolling in the study, this isn't like playing Pokemon, right? Like, gotta catch them all. This is, we need people to not just survive, but live, right? Michelle, you said living with each other. People my are son living. And my daughter. I have a, yeah. To a point that we have intact generations of people living with HIV. Yeah. We need to address that, and yeah. that's where these meetings are so important. The meeting, again, that you all have done, right? That's done. That's going on. Would you be willing, okay, because the next thing I'm going to say, the black and Latino women that I know, that I can mobilize and get them, let's sit down and see if we can put some ideas together. Guess what? They're going to ask for compensation because somebody have already informed them the gay white guys who now saying, Michelle, you and your people in there, because yes, I, I befriend people like you because there is a reality. I know the needs we have, but as soon as it comes in looking at, there needs to be some kind of compensation. I know it's still early. I know it's still early, but there is funds. If it's not allocated for to say, we have an opportunity. There's a group of women who we would like to sit down with they can bring some really great ideas. They can help us, you know, from our mouth to your ears, then put on paper, right? And we want to compensate them. Guess what? I think Jessica's great too. Twenty-five dollars ain't gonna kick it no more. They're not doing that. These women are saying it, Michelle, from everything that I've already given up because it had all got to us, and they drew our bloods, and that's what's going on in wise. And Max, right? That's why I'm saying I'm back at that table because I got thrown off a couple years ago, but that's irrelevant right now. I'm back there again, right? So I've said to them, every bit, right, of the, the, the uh, what do you call them, that they, that they store from us, right? Mm -hmm. I joined WISE, okay, in 1994 when WISE first started. All my samples, and for those of us who have died, and those of us who are still around, right? How are we being even self acknowledged? Or again, I re invited myself to Max Wise because I'm aging now, and because I'm alive at this age, I'm not going to wait until 60, 70, 80, because as I said, I, I'm going to live until. My God take me off of this earth. I'm not a religious person, I'm very spiritual. Truly, and I have a purpose to fulfill, but I cannot do it by myself. I wanna form allegiances, I wanna form, seriously, real, serious, committed folks, but I also do wanna feel as if I'm equal because what I'm contributing is my life and the other hundreds of women that I'm gonna bring. And I think an important I think this idea of building programs is a, is a really key piece. It's not just about recruitment into trials, but it's about building this longevity. And 
I'm just, I know Michael, you, you have been doing a lot of this work with U equals U and like sort of building out these programs. So I know you've had a couple of points that you wanted to say. And go ahead, Michael. I'm not looking forward to it. Oh, it's okay. Can't help. Sure. It. Can't help. Okay. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Um, no, I, I really wanted to sort of respond to the comment about that what I said earlier on about you know like uh, 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 HIV cure and what you know in the communities I think like we hear that a lot in, in the community and I think that comes from somewhere I think I was sad we didn't get to address your question about like where you believe the cure is available people mm -hmm. are just hiding it I think that's like the elephant in the room that we try to avoid all the time and we don't talk about it and not because we just assume people are stupid. And that's when they say those things. But the truth of the fact is that, that that question is coming from somewhere, right? It's coming from mistrust, years of mistrust from black communities against researchers and against like you know white organizations and white led individuals. That comes from somewhere. So until we address those concerns, we're gonna be asking the same questions over and over again. Because people have deep mistrust mm -hmm. of the process. Mm -hmm. This this the, the people who are the, in in front of the response. Yeah. If you look at again, no shade, no, no no tea, but sorry, like all of the researchers here are white people. So yeah. that starts from somewhere. So how do we begin to have people trust the process where people that look like me are not part of those trust people who are doing the research and doing the studies? So I think it's really, really important. Why, again, I agree with your, the, the, the thoughts of your question. I think it's critical. And I think we have to question it. I do believe in the science and data that is out there. But I think again, like the main point is that we really have to make sure we answer and we don't shy away from these yeah. hard questions. Yeah. And it's really Until we do that. You know, I mean, you know? COVID, right? We got a vaccine yeah. in three yeah. months. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's easy to say, right? okay. Oh my God, this person is stupid. That's why it's right. a nice question. Yeah. But it's not really and not, that, and you know? it manifests yeah. in two yeah. ways. It's like, yeah. it, this came in three months, so that's yeah. not real if it yeah. took, you know, yeah. we still yeah. don't have a vaccine. Absolutely, absolutely. And so that is yeah. such a huge that literacy and building these community yeah. and you have relationships. And really in literacy. Mm -hmm. I think we, we talk a lot about mm -hmm. treatment literacy mm -hmm. and community engagement. Mm -hmm. And I think we see, you know, millions of dollars yeah. being done on education, but I think not enough on just like basic treatment literacy. And the organizations and the individuals, again, I'm very calm that, that leads this response are not people of color mm -hmm. in the highest mm -hmm. positions mm -hmm. where the fund has been decided. Mm -hmm. And I think how do you want an immigrant who, you know, again, like, I thought Fatima just sure. said a question yes. about, yeah. about yes. immigration. And if like immigrants in, the, in New York, like I was, again, I, I, I was an immigrant before, I was an immigrant, and I remember how I came to Africa service to get food here. But I think like even in that process, I was struggling to get Medicaid or ADAP. Mm -hmm. I was in ADAP for, for a reason, and I couldn't get health care. So how do you want immigrants to trust a system that is criminalizing them, that is going to send them to jail if they go to the hospitals? So I think like we have to start from somewhere and empower organizations like African Services yeah. because they know the community better. The right mm -hmm. So we have to empower Michelle's group. We have to empower the group that she's saying. So like understanding, understanding those dynamics in those again in my in my view some racism has to play there mm -hmm. as well. So honestly, those things really could really to any HIV cure research. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I'm sorry. I was just, I don't know your name, but you're Michelle's. Ivy, thank you. I apologize. So I have like a couple of questions, and I think I would like to find a roadmap. So I've been talking since '89, so probably Michelle. Um, I'm that color that people don't really see, and I only get to see it because it's Michelle. I tag along with my black sister because she has a lot more sway and a lot more work connections mm -hmm. that I've known. So a couple of things. I wanted to know. I there's a huge problem. Like I, you know, the cure is being said about blah blah blah. But for us long-term survivors, that makes a great difference, mm -hmm. right? So I can't find doctors almost. People are like retiring. I'm getting like people that are 30 years old. I've never seen a CMB. Um, I I can't navigate it anymore, right? So there's that. So when we talk about information, like that's a very The old days, um, I do disagree once again with you, um, Michelle. Access does not know where we are. 
partnerships and work together with you in a meaningful way. It's got to be a win-win for every one of us who are going to come to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, my, look, you all have another question. You all have another statement. My brother Marcelo wants to speak. Uh, I think and the one thing that was occupied most with the garden is that we have occupied spaces that are available. If they are not available, we have to make them available. Mm -hmm. We pay this space. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not just inviting it of course, to be in a study, but in designing this study, too. What did I say? Uh, we have to be part of the whole process. It's not yeah. just pick up us at the end and expect us to be happy uh, there contributing to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, somebody talked here about the interest, the financial interest. I don't forget that. Uh, there is no financial interest in finding a cure because we have got billions of dollars that is spent in the pharmaceutical industry selling medication to keep people alive. In, until we change this paradigm that is more interesting to keep it, to sending people alive cure. and cure them, uh, we, we, we continue seeing studies like this happening 40 years after HIV was first uh, uh, you know, identified here. Uh, Really, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's not, I'm glad to do this, don't get me wrong, but uh, we are really late on this thing and we have to catch up. We cannot start doing the same things again and doing the same mistakes again. The we other thing now. that I would say also too about this, uh, how it into the team, it's great forming the alliances, yes, and getting into, you know, the whale Cornells and the Montefiers, but again, for a lot of us, for a lot of us people of color, we are navigating through these federally qualified health centers, mm -hmm. okay? We are going through those systems and they do not have the infrastructure to accommodate research. 
See what I'm saying? So, so they're not even self-tapped into, but they also too can be a gateway to getting to black and brown folks. Because when the people at Cornell threw me out of the clinic, okay, because I asked to switch my doctors, all right, that's a policy that Cornell have. Who don't know that? I'm putting it out there now. If you ask to switch your doctors as a positive person at Will Cornell, they discharge you. They first give you an option. You have to work this out with your doctor, but you have to stay with your doctor. What is that telling me? I don't have options. That's taking away my right to say she's no longer meeting my needs. We are having too many disagreements. I want to recommend that she retire. She did some great work with the gay white man earlier, but right now she's no longer filling, you know, a bunch of us needs. What is wrong with that? I was taught by the same state of New York, you have a right to choose. You have a right, even if you have Medicaid, okay, to get the best of care. But when you act on that, you get thrown under the damn clinic. <laughs> Yo. So, so Eve has shot. I recognize we also have ten minutes left. So, but but Eve and then um, I guess we're on. So we're gonna hear some next steps. Yeah, I like, I have yes, some today. Yeah. I okay. I like what we did what uh, Eve said earlier regarding uh, immigrants. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was one, and I'm no, I'm an American now. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, I was afraid, terrified to go to the doctor. Yeah. When I go from my house to pay my phone bill and my cable bill and everything else, I have to go to the west side. Along the way, I meet a whole bunch of my friends from Burkina Faso, from Senegal, from from uh, Ivory Coast, from Cameroon, and so forth. French speaking, because I'm French speaking, and uh, so we talk things like that. And this is how I build relationship, one person at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned that from the Manhattan Jerusalem Network. You, some of you mm -hmm. know me from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one person at a time. They ask me a question. Then I tell them, oh yeah, I just went to a conference in the, in the, in the ACDG and uh, what is this? So I talk about, no pressure, it's about this and this and this. <clears throat> and they become curious about stuff. Mm -hmm. and this, is how you, you, this is how you attract people's attention and people's curiosity and people's interest. And it's, a, it, it, it's not happening overnight. Okay? Uh, yes, I'm white, but they trust me. We don't have a problem. And I'm a community representative. I'm not a... Okay? Uh, I created a hashtag on Twitter. HIV is not invincible. And I trust Dr. Uh, Jones and uh, Marina. Uh, I don't think they have a cure because if they had one, they would put it out and make a lot of money with it. Because mm. mm -hmm. they're already paying hundred thousand dollars for a cure for Hep C, so they would mm -hmm. they would be able to sell it for like well, whatever. And uh, the thing, my question is uh, maybe uh, uh, Jonathan may, may yeah. be able to answer that. Uh, a question that I've been asked a few times: to uh, to participate in a clinical trial, does the uh, does the uh, the uh, Immigration status matter. Mm -hmm. <coughs> immigration status matter? Yeah. The only, so there's one condition, one exception where it may come into play. In any clinical trial, we offer compensation for time, travel, like, plus just donating the different samples. Mm -hmm. and all the labs, and so yeah. we compensate for all the different patients. If we compensate more than six hundred dollars in town this year, then we are required to issue a one mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how that would play in. And I think that's actually something that's like Yes, say that right. Of I course, you know. Honey, I'm one of them. That's the only <laughs> that's the only thing that <laughs> in my In fact, one of the points that I I actually emphasize whenever I'm doing the consent. And sometimes the consent documents are nice and short, four, 10 pages. Sometimes they're long documents that are like 40 pages. It's hard to, kind of going back to the health literacy act of the state, it's hard to kind of distill the information out of the consent. Work with your CEO. So, so for example, with the, the trial that we're kind of referencing, the two trials that we're referencing, the way that I frame it is the latent reservoir itself are very, Mm -hmm. 
And one of the medications we give acts like an alarm clock mm -hmm. to wake them up, right? Get mm -hmm. them out of hibernation. That's an easy way to understand. Yes. So going back to that consent aspect, we actually use it to push the confidentiality consideration by the federal government, which means that you cannot be compelled to disclose your participation in the trial, even if we receive a subpoena from a court. We, we do not disclose that information. So there is that layer or that aspect of protection if there is a consent. It doesn't necessarily have many of the concerns. I mean, if the concern is still what we can do, mm -hmm. but we do have that need. And I really felt as well as my colleagues felt that. Um, but yes, immigration status would need. We've worked through so this. I, I, know we, I know we only have five minutes, and I do want to get to, I think it is important to kind of close out on next steps, because I, I think there's a couple of really good threads that I want to make sure we don't leave on the table, and this idea that, that the enterprise is set up to not, to not, try to get people to not have a cure, and to keep people on treatment. And I, I understand that, because it, like I said, COVID's been out there. It, it sort of seems like, how come? Why, why hasn't it happened yet? Yeah. But I, guess, I mean, you would make a lot of money, but also the people in this room that are doing this are doing it because they genuinely have an yeah. investment to move the field forward. And if, if you didn't even believe that, getting your name on a Nobel Prize comes with a million dollars. That in and of itself, right? That's your yeah. money to keep. Yeah. So and you, can, yeah, it is your money. You don't have to do research with it. Um, but I mean, so there's there's uh, there's personal incentives. It's not. It's just hard. And I think that that's a myth that we have to. It, I mean, it's it's not even a myth. That's the truth. That seems so. It seems so silly. Like how hard could it be? And it is hard. And I'm not a scientist. I'm not. A, I'm a bioethicist. I'm a person who had to learn and read papers and ask a lot of questions. And it is so complicated, and it's so easy to say, well, why don't they have it? But that is something that I hope as a next step, uh, we can all take out there, but I would also love to figure out how do we create those spaces to dialogue about the phase one trials and to dialogue about what's going on and to figure out how do we get into spaces yeah. with trans women and trans men and gender non-binary people because we need to get all of those one. bodies and voices, not, in, not just into trials, and I, but into the conversation, yeah. into into the infrastructure of research, so that they can shape how this is happening. I am a cis hetero woman who is sitting here as a you know a biracial individual who is married to a white man who has two children, and that is how I come into this space. And that is not how everybody comes in. And I know that I can't see everywhere where I need to be. Mm -hmm. And we do need to reach out to different populations. So yes. I would love to figure out how we can work together to get people into that conversation of the infrastructure and not just build relationships, but build programs so that you can go out and do the work. We could have Zoom groups. Let's yeah. have some Zoom discussion I love groups. how many hands are up. That's your, you know, a lot of people in certain communities, yes, have gotten customized to this. And we could theme it. You know what I'm saying? We can theme it for different, you know, topic based. Again, we know what would entice, you know, our peers, our counterparts who will participate. But I'm saying a good starting point right now. Women love to hang out and chat on the Zoom. I'm just saying. I have a quick question. Just to add on to what you said, I think as you identified, it's important for us to find our way into these spaces. I think people and. Believe me when I say I understand where I am when I say this, right? I understand where I'm coming from. I think it's important that we establish the relationship so that everyone is mindful on stage right now. I think it's a two-way street, right? It's it's great that I'm here, but I would love to see some of your faces in my office. Honey, plan the meeting. Yes. What day? What day? I'll be there. Honey, myself, and I got to get a two. It's um, big enough. Bring it, honey. I'll, I'll be in the toilet if it has Give to be. Give me the day. We can. You only need one of us. Let's set a day. Hello. It's and I'm free every day, anytime, Shh. except on Sunday. <laughs> I don't have a nine to five, so there's no reason why I can't be there. Oh, so let's not make it seem like it's difficult. I'd be hands up. We're I'd here now. Yeah, hello. I'm ready. Let me know could where I need to be. Could we set a day? Could we to follow up? Is that could be some next step? Because yeah. honey, this is accountability. We're moving forward. 
We got witnesses. Let's set the day. Yeah. I got my book. We'll be there. I have a question. So the other thing is those long term survivors and all those things, like we're not a commodity. We're right. an economy, right? And I get that. Uh, because the way we, we parlay pharma in it. But I think the researchers in itself should step up your relationship with like business as well, right? And this is like a history of before act up until we had like gay men that were rich that gave us their resources that were in Wall Street that could actually do a timeline of what it was like to have three generations die in different economies. This is the only time that people put money in this. If Moderna gets $1.5 billion just as taxpayer money, if you guys are in environments of academia, you can tap it into different people to help you rewrite the way business is done. By doing that, then you can accommodate stakeholders to decide how they should be compensated because it doesn't have to be like that $25 per the next part. Because yeah. we've seen that. And when the industry makes that much money, it is an effort that it needs to step up your, your relationship to financial content to look at the cost of life. So when I say that at this like 40 years, is that people, can thank people with HIV or COVID. For everybody yep. that's packing pack low bit, you're welcome. So mm -hmm. we want to go back into that investment. Yes. And I want you guys to step up that relationship. So Absolutely. Reach has two industry partners and and I will say let's chat after this because I think we can talk about how we can network into that industry yeah. a lot more. Yeah. Yes. We are it is an untapped yes. resource. And I'm gonna let you have the Je last Gemma, my last question is very simple. Uh, you know, because I, I'm politically centrist, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. I, go, I go to Republican spaces, I go to the Democrat spaces, I go everywhere. Call it like it is. I'm not shy about it. This is the United States freedom of speech. But Republicans have been saying that, because I'm the main one, they saying that the HIV is the cousin of the COVID-19. Are they related? Yeah. Totally different. Yeah. So they were saying uh, constants and blah, 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 blah. They're talking, you know, conspiracy theorists. Yeah, yes. exactly, bro. That's so we have to find out the truth. Mm -hmm. I listen to them, but then I find out the truth. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to thank, obviously, our panelists for great. sharing their expertise and data, but I want to thank all of you because you came with your Everybody. questions and your energy. Yeah. The guy and all yeah. Yeah. I know that someone's going to be hanging around um, for a bit, especially as we Say clean up hi. the food. There's extra food, which means Take it home, take your cookies, take your salad.